Chapter 17 is pensions, and although the chances of you ever having to deal with pensions are slim, since most companies don't have them anymore, we still have to cover it, so here goes. And part one, we're going to look at the opponents and journals for doing the pension expense. And then in part two, we'll do the other, which is the uh, pension obligation and the pension assets. So there's actually three components, and we'll walk through those in this presentation and the next. Now, there are two types of pension plans. Most companies have gone to the defined contribution pension plans. That is, they promise fixed annual contributions to the pension fund, but once they make that contribution, their obligation is gone. Now, the kind they used to have, which meant that people had to stay at the same company for a long period of time to receive it, is called a defined benefit plan. And this is where uh, most schools and uh, government agencies have still have defined benefit pension plans, which means you have to stay there and then retire and have so many years of service, and then you're going to get a fixed amount for the rest of your life. So it's a promised fixed retirement benefits defined by a designated formula pension formulas base retirement pay on the employee's year of service, annual compensation, and sometimes age. They promise a fixed retirement benefit defined by a pension formula. Now, there are three elements associated with a pension plan. There is the employer's obligation to pay retirement benefits in the future. Now, this is where the liability itself. And then plan assets are set aside by an employer from which to pay the retirement benefits in the future. So this is an asset where they set aside funds and property in order to cover these future expenses. And then associated with these are periodic expense of having a pension plan. And that's what we're going to focus on in this presentation. Now, the components of pension expense. There is service cost, which is ascribed to employee service during the period. These are costs associated with people having work during the period. That is done by some formula, and don't worry, you do not have to figure out service cost. Interest accrued on the pension liability. We'll go through how that's done. Return on the plan assets, and remember, it's always based on the expected return, not the actual. And then, in addition, we have to amortize a portion of any prior service attributed to the employee service before an amendment to the pension plan, if there is one, or any losses or gains from revisions in the pension liability or in the investing plan assets, if there is any. And when you add all of that, you get your pension expense. And now what we'll do is look at a problem, and then we'll work through all those elements. Now, here is our example. The following changes occurred to the plan benefit obligation for 2018. We have prior service, 2018, from plan amendment at the beginning of 2015. Now, remember, this is not an adjustment in the current year. If it was, we would ignore it. But since this is from prior years, we have to pay attention to it. And in this example, they told us it's going to be amortized at $4 million per year. That's the number we want, that $4 million. Then we have a net loss in accumulated other comprehensive income at 1-1. These are previous losses which are currently exceed our gain because it's a net amount. And we have an $80 million accumulated loss. Then we have average remaining service life of the active employee group, which is 10 years, and then we have the actuary's discounted rate of 7%. Then we show our plan benefit obligation at the end of the year, also referred to as the PBO, and we have the plan assets, our beginning balance, and then the ending balance at the end of the year. And so the first thing we're going to do is determine the pension expense. Now, 
The net difference between the obligation, i.e. the PBO, and the plan assets determine if a company is under or overfunded. And in our example, we are underfunded based on the fact that our obligation exceeds our assets. Now, service cost. Service cost is the increase in the projected obligation attributable to employee service performance during the year. These are actually benefits earned by employees during the year. You are not required to do this calculation, although they show you how it's done in the book, and is part of both pension expense and projected benefit obligation. So in our example, they gave the amount, which is $80 million. Next, there is the interest accrued on pension liability. The interest rate times the beginning balance of projected benefit obligation, or PBO, to determine the amount of interest to include in pension expense. In our example, they gave the interest cost of $42 million, but if it had not been provided, we would take the actuarial amount of 7% times the beginning balance in our PBO, or projected benefit obligation, and again, we would get the $42 million. So that would be how they would have gotten that number or how you would get that number if you were working a problem and they did not provide it. Return on plan assets. The rule is that when the expected return is different than the actual return, you use the expected return percentage times the plan assets at 1-1 to determine the amount that you would include in pension expense. Remember, that's the amount that goes to pension expense. So in our example, we would take 400 million times 10% and we get 40 million. Now, gain or losses, gain or loss portion of pension expense. When the pension obligation is higher or lower than expected, when the return on plan assets is higher or lower than expense, and this is what's going to cause us to have gain or losses. Now, amortization of net gain or losses from revisions in pension liability that is part of accumulated other comprehensive income, which we know is part of the equity section on the balance sheet. FASB says that if the net gain or loss in accumulated other comprehensive income at the beginning of the year is greater than 10% of the projected benefit obligation or plan assets, whichever is higher, then the pension expense must be adjusted. In our example, the Plan benefit obligation is $600 million. We take that times 10% and we get $60 million and we compare that to the plan assets of $400 million times 10%, which gives you $40 million. So we're going to use the $60 million because that's higher and we're going to compare that to the $80 million and accumulated other comprehensive income. Now in our case, we have a net loss in accumulated other comprehensive income. The PBO is we're going to subtract 60 million so the amount to amortize is going to be 20 million however we're going to spread that over the service life the remaining service life of the active people so we're going to expense 2 million in 2018. So now we can determine the pension expense. We have our service cost which was provided we have our interest cost, which is the beginning balance times the discount rate. We have less expected return, which is 400 million times 10%. And remember, that's always times the expected return, and we always back that out. We're going to amortize prior service provided in the problem. And what we have to do is add in the loss. Now, if it was a gain, we would be subtracting it. We're going to add all those up. And remember, amortize prior service costs, prior service and amortization of net loss are both part of other comprehensive income. Now we get our pension expense of $88 million. Now, the next thing we need to, need to figure out are what are our journal entries for pension expense. So, 
our pension expense journal, our pension expense is going to be 88 million. Plan assets or expected return on assets is going to get hit with 40 million. Amortization of net loss, other comprehensive income, and amortization of prior service, other comprehensive income is going to be journalized. And then PBO is going to get the 80 million in service plus 42 in interest is 122. So that would be our journal entry when we do our pension expense. Now, what is the journal entry recording the gain or losses? Record the difference between the expected and actual return on assets. So in our case, we did have a different number. So our loss, which was, it turned out, we have a loss because the expected return was actually higher than what we actually received. So we have a loss on that of 8 million. So if you subtract that from the 40, we get the 32 that we see in our um, assets. Sorry about the barking dog. Let me get back to this. Now we're also going to reduce our plan assets by this difference between what we thought we would get and what we actually received, which was less. So the record, the gain or loss on plan benefit obligation, this occurs based on changing assumption and was provided in the problem. So we have plan benefit obligations is going to be reduced and the offset is going to be gain other comprehensive income. Now, what is the journal entry for the cash contribution to the plan assets? It's going to be plan assets, cash. What's the journal entry for the retiree benefits? It's going to be projected plan benefits it reduces the projected plan benefits or PBO obligation and the it's going to reduce our plan assets. Now what amount would be shown in 2018 balance sheet as a net pension asset or liability? The plan assets are 484, the plan benefit obligation is 670, so we would end up with a hundred and eighty six thousand eighty one hundred eighty six million net pension liability so we are underfunded in this example and now we'll move on to part two again i have designed these around your homework if you have any questions remember to email me